Hey folks, welcome to another Triple T Thursday. For those just joining us, it's tools, tips, and talk where we'll discuss info for the knife maker. In today's episode, we're gonna continue our Damascus pattern series, and this time we're gonna do Raindrop Damascus. We're gonna take this billet that um, we did the other half in ladder pattern last week. We're gonna turn this into a beautiful raindrop pattern. So let's go down to the table and talk about raindrop a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about Raindrop Damascus. First, the billet we're going to be using is uh, the one we forged from last week's episode. It's 3 8 thick, and it is 100 layers of uh, alternating 1084 and 15 and 20 steel. So that's what we're going to be using. Raindrop Damascus is another um, subtractive pattern, meaning we're going to be removing some of the steel um, from the billet so that when we repress it, the layers where it gets removed will get pressed up to the surface or the other part pressed down, however you want to think about it, uh, and that will expose the layers. So what we're going to be doing is drilling some holes with some drills. And what will happen is you will basically see little concentric circles like this. Okay, whenever, wherever we put a drill, um, drill a hole, you'll see these concentric circles. And it looks kind of cool. So when I do this, I always recommend you do a random pattern of holes. And don't do just one size drill bit. That's the first tip. We're going to be using at least three sizes of drill bits. The largest one being a half, a half inch and again I'll put the metric down on the screen we'll be doing a half inch probably something like um, um, 3 16 and then we'll probably also do actually this will be a quarter a quarter and we might even go as as low as an eighth of an inch okay so at least those three sizes um, and then we're going to randomize them all over the billet so let's go do that. The, um, the other tip really is you only want to go a third of the way through the billet, okay? Because you do not want to risk these touching each other on either side. So we're going to, this is three eighths, so we're going to go an eighth, maximum an eighth through the billet on either side, and we'll still have an eighth in the center, okay? Other thing is set the stop on your drill press. Don't try to do this by eye. Set the drill stop so that you can just hit the drill press all over the place and not worry about how deep you're going. All right, let's take this over to the drill press and get it going. So if you've never used the stop on your drill press, that's just these two nuts. They're normally all the way up at the top, but I've lowered them here so that it will just stop. Then you just put two wrenches together and just tighten these against each other. And we're all set. I started drilling this and I couldn't quite figure out, was there just a hard spot or were my drills just really dull? So I came to the conclusion that it was probably a combination of both. So after trying to drill this for a little while, I decided to anneal it in the oven and then try to redrill it. I was way more successful after annealing this billet and using a sharp drill bit. So here I'm just going in, filling in all the holes, and looking back, and I'll say this at the end, I probably should have put the holes closer together. That would have made for a nicer pattern. I don't do this pattern very often. In fact, I think this is only the second or third time I've done it. So I'm still learning it myself, but it definitely would look better if all of the holes are touching and even overlapping. Now I'm just adding a little rebar handle so I can grab it with the tongs. When you're doing this, make sure you add a lot of weld to the joint. So here's the billet after drilling all the holes. You can see there's lots of different size holes all randomly placed. I just feel that this looks the best on the final um, billet and again on the other side. So um, I like the random pattern. We'll see at the uh, when we press it. Also, don't forget, a lot of people just kind of put the holes in the middle. Don't forget to put some on the very edges here because uh, you want your billet to look kind of uniform and not all the pattern in the center. All right, 
Let's get it in the forge and press it flat. There's no forge welding here, so no need for flux. Didn't even have to get it up to forge welding temperatures. Here we're just getting it out of the forge and flattening it out. I don't really know why I had the dies in the long position here. They're much better the other way, so that's what I switched to. If you don't have a press, this may not be obvious to you, but presses are not really good at thin pieces of steel. Uh, they're much better at thicker pieces and squishing them down, so that's why it's important to take small bites and have a narrow die so you don't have a lot of area to impact. If you don't have a press, this may not be obvious to you, but presses are not really good at thin pieces of steel. Uh, they're much better at thicker pieces and squishing them down, so that's why it's important to take small bites and have a narrow die so you don't have a lot of area to impact. Now we're going to draw out and reduce the thickness of this billet and try to get rid of all of those dimples. I know a rolling mill is a luxury and most people won't have one, but it certainly has a lot of benefits. The first one being that it only draws in one direction, so you're not widening the billet at all. You do have to be careful with that aspect though, because here you're going to distort the pattern a little bit and your circles might become ovals if you'd use the mill too much because it'll draw only in one direction. The other benefit is that there's very little heat loss. The rollers come in contact with the steel very little, so it doesn't pull a lot of heat away, like a press does. There can be problems with rolling mills. Here I've locked it up because there's a place that's got a divot and then the next part kind of stopped it. So here you gotta turn it off, use a hammer, reduce the, uh, the lead screw so that you can get the steel out again and restart. This is our final round on the mill. We should have it to the right thickness and got rid of most of those dimples. You'll see later that there's a couple that persist, but I think we got most of them. As per usual, my final step here is just take it to the press, get it all nice and flat and ready for surface grinding. Now I'm at the grinder with an old 36 grit belt and I'm really just taking the scale off here a lot of times I would recommend to do this with an angle grinder with a thick disc on it, but the billet was already thin enough, so I didn't want to thin it out too much more. I got enough scale off now, we're going to go to the surface grinder. So I just knocked the scale off on the, um, on the grinder, and this is one of the reasons why I don't like uh, raindrop. You can see you think you got it all flat. Like this looked like it came out all flat but you can see there's some some divots in it still so I'm gonna have to grind this down quite a bit. So that's no fun at all. This is a brand new Broadbeck incinerator belt. Those are 36 grit belts. The best on the market. So here I am surface grinding this and guys if you don't have a surface grinder uh, this is really painful. <laughs> it's just much easier to do this on this kind of surface grinder. Now I'm moving on to a 120 grit belt just to get a nicer finish. I end up using a 600 grit belt later just to get an even nicer finish before the etch. So we've surface ground this to 120. Um, you can see there's still a little mark uh, right here and another one on this side. There's just no point grinding that all the way down. Um, whoever puts the knife on it will uh, will um, just go around that or it'll come out on the bevel or something like that. So that's fine. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so here it is. Uh, I had to actually go and re-grind it to 600 grit um, just so the pattern showed up a little better, but um, there you see it. So it looks pretty cool. Um, some things I would change. Uh, I would actually put more holes in, overlap them more. Um, 
it, I think it looks kind of cool without these spaces um, where you see just the random pattern. Uh, but that's just me. Some people like that. Um, I think it looks cool when they're all the holes are connected. Uh, I had to grind off more than I wanted to. Um, so some of the smaller holes probably got ground out quite a bit. So that's why there's a lot of these flat spots. But um, overall it looks pretty good. Um, it came out uh, about an eighth of an inch. Yeah, eighth of an inch thick. So um, yeah, so there it is. Raindrop pattern. Not my favorite pattern to be quite honest. Um, I, I'm just not a huge fan of the look of it. Um, you know, I've made it before and it, and it can look cool, but you know, not my personal favorite. But uh, it isn't a pretty easy one to do. You just got to be careful with the holes. So even I went a little too deep on this one. Um, but that's the main problem is if you go too deep, you'll have a little divot. So with one divot is not, not too bad. And it's not actually that deep. So um, that'll be easy to get out for whoever uses this, whoever uses this billet. Thanks for joining me, folks, on this episode of Raindrop Damascus. Um, it's a pretty easy pattern to do, as you saw, uh, so a quick video today. Um, also want to mention our sponsor, Maritime Knife Supply. So if you need steel for Damascus or anything else knife related, go check out Maritime Knife Supply. I uh, haven't quite figured out what we're going to do in the next episode. Um, we may talk about some, some basics um, of future pattern development. So stay tuned and uh, you'll see what I mean. Thanks for watching, folks, and we'll see you on the next one.